Amen. 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 Welcome, friends, to First United Methodist Church of Fort Natchez uh, for our Sunday morning Easter Sunday service in stark contrast with the uh, worship, the service of Tenebrae for Friday evening, which was very subdued and solemn as we remembered the crucifixion of Christ. Now we remember and celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Amen. Amen. And I knew when I came up here and Eddie took off his shoes to play, we were in for a treat. So, uh, a quick announcement before we get into the service. Uh, in a minute, we're going to have the celebration of baptism. And I use this baptismal table here. Whenever I do a baptism, I pour the water over these river stones that are inside here they're, so that they're completely submerged in water. And this gives us an opportunity each at the end of the service to reach into the water, remembering our own baptism and, uh, and removing a stone that you could take with you to commemorate the date. What I need, because immediately after this, we've got our Mother's Day Out kids coming up here to sing. And other youth. And so what I need, as soon as we're done with the uh, baptism, I need a couple uh, strong backs to carry this table and the contents of it to the uh, entryway of the church for me, please. And then as you leave today, you're welcome to reach in and take a stone with you. Amen? All right, let's get started. Let's begin with a, with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Heavenly Father. Lord God, we thank you for today. Of all days, God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship. God, there are never enough words uh, when we approach your throne of grace to thank you for what you've done for us through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. But God, we thank you as much as we possibly can. And for those who are here with us for the service and the sacrament of baptism, to hear your spoken word, to sing your praises, God, we are truly overjoyed and blessed beyond measure. God, we ask that you will help us to leave any unnecessary distractions behind. Help us to be totally present here in this moment, in this space, and put our full attention on glorifying you and lifting up your holy name, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll join me in our call to worship. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and to those in the tombs restoring life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and to those in the tombs restoring life. Alleluia, the risen Christ is with us. Thanks be to God, alleluia. And if you'll please join us in our first hymn on 322. Please stand as you're able.
this time, I would like to invite the family of Hannah Bevins and of Madeline Lucignolo to come forward for our service of baptism. And if you all would, find a United Methodist hymnal in front of you and turn to page 33 and follow along. In this baptismal liturgy, there will be questions that I ask the, the, um, those that are being baptized. There will be questions that I ask the family, and there will be questions that I ask you as a congregation, and you will be asked to, you'll be prompted um, to respond accordingly. Um, could you guys come up here to this level? Was there enough room to, to do that? And there's a few uh, copies there. If you could hand me if, them, if y'all are sharing one. Thank you. And that's going to be page 33. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. I present now Hannah Bevins and Madeline Lucignolo for baptism. I will ask you these questions, Hannah. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Now I will ask you, Kevin and Sarah, will you nurture Madeline in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself to profess her faith openly and to lead a Christian life. Excellent. And all of you up here. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? Turn over to page 35, number eight. This is where I address you all as a congregation. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, Eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. We can put the hymn. We can put the hymnals down. Hannah. Hannah Bevins. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Madeline, my niece, Madeline. Madeline, I baptize you in the name of the Father. I know, I know. And of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, sweetie. I know. I know, I know, I know. It's okay, sweetie. I know, I know. One moment and we'll be. Both of you. The Holy Spirit worked within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now it is our joy to welcome our new sisters in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as members of the family of Christ. Amen. And this is for you all. These roses were given um, on behalf of each of you. Each of you have a rose. Hannah, this is for you, your certificate of baptism. And this is for lovely Madeline. Welcome, our new family of Christ. You all need to see. Um, that would help, yes. Straight down the aisle and in the entryway, kind of turn sideways just to see if we can grab one of them right now. Okay, thank you. You know, sometimes we baptize by full immersion, and sometimes we baptize by sprinkling. And I've always said theologically that if the baptism had to do with the amount of water, 
there's not enough water on earth to forgive me of my sins, to wash me clean. Amen? Amen. Okay, uh, at this time, our Mother's Day Out children and any other uh, youth who are going to participate will come forward and sing a few songs for us that they've been par- preparing for Easter Sunday. dismissed to go to Children's Church, where Miss Cynthia and Miss Amy have prepared a, a lesson for the kids, and um, they will be back at the end of our uh, service today. And I want to tell you, it's, this is the last time this school year that they'll be joining us in service, and I've spoken about this before, but we have chapel together every Thursday morning in here, and we sing songs, and we pray, and I tell them stories from the little children's Bible about Jesus, and It does not matter what is going on in my life. You cannot walk away from that in a bad mood. You see these little kids getting excited about God and singing these songs, and it's just, it's such an uplifting experience. So for the parents, it's been a great joy to have them with us, and um, I'm very glad that our church uh, supports that ministry. I think it's very, very important. Okie doke. Please join us on page 839, Psalm 118, response number two.
strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. There, there are joyous songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad. Next page. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has, has become, become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This, this is, is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God who has given us light. Lead the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad. Heavenly Father, we thank you. This is indeed the Lord, the day that you have made, Lord. We are so blessed. We thank you for those who have received baptism this morning. God, we thank you for the kids who have come to sing songs to us and, and, and show the excitement that they have to be in church. God, we are, our cup is overflowing with the goodness that you have bestowed upon us. But God, we also recognize that there are many who are going through very difficult times right now, many trials and tribulations, some of which we know nothing about. And God, we ask that you will wrap these persons in your love, your mercy, your grace. Help them to somehow know that they have a community of faith who is lifting them up in prayer and help us to be in ministry with those persons, those who just need a friendly face, those who need their physical needs met with food and shelter, and those who are suffering various afflictions or are sick and in distress. God, we know that all, all good things come from you. God, and we know that you're the great healer. God, we ask that when it's in your will, that you will restore these people to full health, physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically. God, when it's not in your will that they should be restored to full health, help them to arrive at a peace, knowing that all is according to your plan and that in the great resurrection, we all will be together without affliction, without suffering, and without pain. And God, how do we approach the throne of grace? What words can we say to you to adequately, adequately express our reverence and our awe and our thanks. God, our hearts are drawn to you when you reach out and grab us by our hearts through your provenient grace and you draw us to yourself as your children. We still 
don't know what to say. We have mumbling lips. We don't speak eloquently. But God, we come to you in this time as we do in those times with the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray when he taught them to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Stand as you're able and join us in the second hymn, He is Lord, 177. We'll sing through it twice. first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. 
Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would please stand as you're able for our gospel reading this morning. This is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, Suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. They did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves. He then went home amazed at what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be you may be seated. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word this morning. And God, I respect the responsibility that comes with that. I ask that you strengthen me when I'm weak, prop me up when I need your assistance. God, if I begin to stumble, then close my mouth. We'll let all things be to your glory and not my own, God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Al Capone was born in 1899, and he lived 48 years and died in 1947, I believe. Al Capone is a pretty well-known modern historical figure, more infamous than famous, did some atrocious things in his life. He was a famous mobster, and he went and carried out his mobster business throughout the Midwest until eventually he was arrested and served prison time for tax evasion. 11 years in prison, and I, I suspect tax evasion is what he pled down to in court, but I don't know for certain. Now, years later, after his passing, the year 1986 rolls around, and some people had discovered this old, uh, this old tomb, this old vault that belonged to Al Capone. And people said, oh, I wonder what's in there. We don't have the combination. We can't get in there. I wonder what might be in there. So people started speculating about it. They said, wow, maybe there's a bunch of riches. Maybe there's a bunch of of documents that'll, that'll prove some of the crimes that he did. Some suggested maybe the body of Jimmy Hoffa would be in there. But there was no telling what was going to be in the tomb. So they did the most practical thing possible. They got Geraldo Rivera to do a one-hour live special on the opening of Al Capone's vault. They were going to do this live. It was going to be this blockbuster event it was going to take an hour, and they were going to break open the, the vault, and they were going to reveal to the world. We'd all find out together what was in that vault. So the time came, and the hour went by, and this was network television, so you had commercial breaks, and they would spend time telling about Al Capone and you know his life and how crazy it was, and then go to commercial. And then they'd come back and, and talk about him again and say, let's... You know, they would get witnesses. What do you think's in there? Well, I don't know. What do you think's in there? 
And then they'd go to commercial again, and Geraldo would keep saying, don't worry, right after the break, we're going to find out. So in the last 10 minutes of the program, they said, okay, we've done it. We've got our safe crackers here. We're, we're going to get into the, into the vault, and we're going to find out what's inside there. And so right there on live television in front of the whole world, they cracked open the vault, and what did they find? Nothing. The vault was empty. So Geraldo, having you know, uh, kind of built this up over the last few weeks and made a big deal of it and all the speculation. There on live TV, he just kind of looked over and went, eh, you know, what, what can he do? And, well, Jim, sorry about that, you know. For everybody who was watching, there was great anticipation of what was going to be found in that vault. And when it was opened up and it was empty, what a crushing disappointment. We wanted something exciting. We wanted something to be in the vault. Well, for Christians, we don't see it the same way. When that vault on the third day, when that tomb was discovered to be empty, what a great joy that was. That was a time when the stone had been rolled aside and finding an empty tomb was the best thing we possibly could have found. Now, at the time they might not have thought so. The ladies who first got to the tomb would have been, as it says, perplexed. They're going about their business of how you handle what is essentially a funeral and a burial. And they go, they find that there's no body of Jesus, there's two shining men in there with them, and, you know, these angelic, fig these angelic figures, they go back and they tell their friends. And what do their friends say? What do you mean there's no body? What, where'd the body go? Was there not a huge stone in front of the... What do you mean? So Peter doesn't even believe it. He has to run and stoop and look in to see, see for himself that Jesus was not there. Well, then they come to, come to find out that Jesus had been risen from the dead. In the other gospel accounts of it, they believed that they saw the gardener. And, they say, and Mary said, please... If, did you steal the body or something? Tell me where you put the body. And it was actually Jesus, not a gardener. And she ran and embraced him, and Jesus brought her into himself, and everyone was overjoyed. Now, everybody had already known what Jesus had been doing in his ministry throughout the region of Judea, in Galilee, in Jerusalem. Um, he had already risen two people from the dead. He had raised the widow's son, and he had raised Lazarus. He had turned water into wine. He had healed lepers. He had calmed the storm. He had done all these things, and he had even said, I'm going to be turned over to the authorities. They're going to savagely beat me. They're going to crucify me, and after three days, I'm going to be resurrected. And yet, when all these things took place, the disciples still didn't believe it. They needed some proof. So if you remember the story of doubting Thomas, Thomas said, there's no way I believe it. There's a, it, it might be a Jesus impersonator. It might be some, some spiritual hologram of some kind. But there's no way that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And what did Jesus say? He said, come over here then. Put, take your finger and feel where the nail has gone through my hand. Feel where I was crucified. Don't be unbelieving. Be believing. Understand that I did these things to fulfill uh, the Old Testament prophecy and God's uh, soteriological plan for the salvation of mankind. There was a story that I heard that was um, interesting recently about a couple who had just been married. And on their wedding night, if you've ever been married or you've been to a wedding or you've played any part in a wedding, you know that it is a long ordeal. It's exciting, yes, but after months of planning, the wedding day rolls around and you spend all day going through the ceremony and you're on your feet and everybody there wants to talk to you and tell them, how, you know, and you're exhausted. When you're the one getting married, you're exhausted. Well, this couple, finally at 10 o'clock p.m., all their obligations are, are taken care of, 
and they are led by the by the hotel person um, to their uh, to their honeymoon suite to the to the suite where they were going to be staying the night. So they walked into the room, and he says, "Here you go." They say, "Thank you," and it looks like any other hotel room any you've ever been in. You know, it's just a just a hotel room. And they say, "Okay," so they put their bags down and. Okay, here's the restroom, okay, a mini fridge, a little kitchenette, couch, sofa. Where's the bed? There's no bed. So they're scratching their head. They're, they're saying, what are we going to do? We've been through so much today. They're messing around. They finally find that the bed is this fold-out couch bed, right? So they're so exhausted. They say, whatever, fine, we'll sleep on the fold-out couch bed. So all night they tossed and turned and the springs were jabbing them in the ribs and it was just an awful experience. Well, they got up the next day. The husband goes down to the front desk. He said, hey, we were supposed to have the presidential suite. We ended up getting this Motel 6 type deal without even a bed. We were so uncomfortable all night tossing and turning. And he said, I don't know, what are you talking about? That's the honeymoon suite. He said, they said, come up there with us. He said, okay, I'll show you. So they walk up there. And they walk in the door and they say, look, what a, you know, you look around and tell me what you see. And he said, well, did you open the door? And they were like, what door, the closet? And he was like, no. He opens up the door and there's the big honeymoon suite. <laughs> there was a basket of fruit. There was champagne. There was everything that you could want. A big private bathroom with a jacuzzi. It was a, it was a, it was a suite. They hadn't looked. They hadn't searched, right? You know the scripture, knock and the door shall be opened, seek and you shall find, ask and it shall be given to you. They didn't adequately seek what they were looking for and thus they didn't find it. They made it through the night, but it wasn't what they were looking for. I think how often we seek God in the wrong places. How often, as our scripture says today, do we seek the living among the dead? How often are we looking for God, thinking we know we're gonna, where we're going to find Him, and then we seemingly just over and over come up empty-handed? We have to understand that we may find God in places where we don't normally expect to find Him. And lastly, if you'll notice that when the ladies in our passage today went back and told the others, that Jesus Christ had been resurrected and that they had seen him in person, they had encountered him and he was alive. Nobody believed them. I believe this is sometimes true for ourselves as well. There are times that we doubt our faith. There are people that we've probably all known who have gone through their lives who would not say that they were Christians. They may have gone to church a few times, but you wouldn't really know. They're not, you know, every Sunday type Christians, and they may be wretched sinners for all, for all you know. And it seems that many times when these people come to find Christ, usually in some place where they don't expect to find him, you've heard that old story, I found Jesus on a jailhouse floor, right? These people who have not lived a Christian life, they find Christ. They find, they find this, uh, this resurrection within themselves. They have now come out of their own tomb and have been resurrected themselves. They are no longer truly dead to their sins and their trespasses, but they're alive again, and they're more alive than they've ever been before. And many times, they go and they tell their friends, and their friends do not believe them. Because in their friends' minds, this person has not really found Jesus. This person has not been erected. There is no Jesus in their life. You belong back in that tomb, because that's who you really are. Don't think for a second, if that's you, that you're the first person to experience this. Today is the great day of resurrection. We celebrate Jesus having been resurrected from the dead. We too can be resurrected from the dead, spiritually and literally. Spiritually, 
we can begin this very day to live a brand new life, one that is filled with Christ, one in which we experience the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that resurrected Jesus from that tomb can resurrect us from whatever sins that we, from whatever sins it has that we've been carrying around with us. And secondly, we are told that eventually there will be a true great resurrection. That all the difficulties of this life, this transitory existence, the aches and the pains and the heartache and the times that you've been betrayed and the times that you've wept and all the difficulties that you've experienced in this life, we are told that in the great resurrection, our bodies are going to be resurrected, but they will be perfect. Because God is perfect. Jesus is perfect. And in heaven, there is no room for imperfection. Therefore, when our bodies are resurrected at the end of the days, we will not have those same afflictions. We will not be held back by physical limitations. But we will be in our perfect form in the presence of Jesus Christ forever. The scripture tells us every tear will be dried and wiped away. So I'll leave you with the message today that on this great day of resurrection, when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was literally resurrected from the dead to fulfill the old and new scriptures and let us know that through our faith in Jesus Christ, we too will conquer death. That is our lesson to take away today. So we should go forth as Christians knowing that we are conquerors. We are not made to be in a tomb, closed up behind a dark stone, living in our sins. We are made to be conquerors and living in the Spirit of Christ. Amen? Amen. this time, I would ask our ushers to come forward, please, for this morning's offering. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for all that you, all the gifts that you've bestowed upon us and all that you continue to do in our lives and all that we know that, that you have planned for us in your lives in our lives. God, we ask that as our tithes and offerings are offered this morning, that you will help us to be responsible stewards of these resources that belong to you and belong to your church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
this wondrous love, this wondrous love. <laughs> Please join us in our last hymn, He Lives.
would like to close with a short prayer from John Wesley. Almighty God, who through the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, has overcome death and opened, us, opened unto us the gate of everlasting life, we humbly beseech thee that as by thy special grace preventing us, thou dost put into our minds good desires. So by thy continual help we may bring the same to good effect through Jesus Christ our Lord who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Friends, go forth with the peace that surpasses all understanding, knowing that you are redeemed by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.